I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of Ruth as we prepare for this penultimate, that is next to last sermon in this short six-week sermon series from the Old Testament book of Ruth. Just a reminder, if you're having a hard time finding Ruth, it comes after Judges and just before First Samuel. So it's toward the front of your Bibles. If you didn't bring a Bible, there are Bibles in the pew racks in front of you. I believe you'll find Ruth on page 222 in those Bibles. Today our sermon text is going to be Ruth chapter 4, which might be on page 223, I'm not sure. But um, Ruth chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. As you're turning there, I want to remind you, you're probably aware, that we've been following the story of Naomi and Ruth. These are two widows in desperate need of redemption. Remember, Naomi is an Israelite widow. She's bitter with grief, having lost not only her husband, Elimelech, but also her two sons, Malon and Kilion, during a 10-year sojourn in the land of Moab. Now, Ruth is Naomi's Moabite daughter-in-law, and she's returned with Naomi to Naomi's hometown of Bethlehem, in the land of Judah. And not only has Ruth returned with Naomi as a loyal friend, but she's also pledged her allegiance to Naomi's God, to the one true God, Yahweh, the creator of the heavens and earth. So while Ruth was a Moabite by ethnicity, we could say that she's an Israelite by faith. These women were vulnerable. And no husbands, no children, and no long-term economic stability. They're in need of redemption. But by God's gracious providence, Naomi and Ruth have become acquainted, or maybe for Naomi, reacquainted, with a man named Boaz. Boaz is a close relative of Naomi's deceased husband, Elimelech. Not only is he a close relative, he's also one of their family redeemers. It's a technical role, a technical term that describes a close relative who's been designated to redeem family members out of poverty. A redeemer, like Boaz, had been designated to marry a widow in order to beget children and carry on the family name of the deceased husband. And a redeemer also had the responsibility to buy back land that had once belonged free and clear to a family. This was how God, in the Old Testament era, was going to care for widows and those impoverished. And last week, in chapter 3, we saw a plan and a request and a promise of redemption. Remember? Naomi, she planned this midnight encounter between Ruth, her daughter-in-law, and Boaz. She planned that at the threshing floor with all sorts of details. And then Ruth, she boldly requested that Boaz redeem her, that he take her to be his wife, to, to marry her. And then Boaz promised to marry Ruth. But there was a snag in the process. As it turns out, there was a nearer redeemer than Boaz. A, a closer relative who had the right and responsibility to marry Ruth before Boaz would have that opportunity. So last week's passage in Ruth chapter 3 left with this cliffhanger. Would Boaz marry Ruth? Would this redemption actually be accomplished? 
Well, chapter 4, verses 1 through 12, answers these important questions about Ruth and Boaz and redemption accomplished. So please listen and follow along in your Bible as I read God's word to us from Ruth chapter 4. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, Turn aside, friend. Sit down here. <clears throat> and he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, Buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, The day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was the manner of a testing in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilion and to Malon. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not cut, be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. Mission accomplished. Heard that phrase before, right? It's a phrase that we use to celebrate the completion of a task or the achievement of a goal. Mission accomplished. Now you might hear it in a corporate boardroom after the successful merger of two companies. Mission accomplished. You might hear it on the court after a championship season. Mission accomplished. Or you might hear it on the battlefield after defeating the enemy. Mission accomplished. By the way, I hope that you took the time last Wednesday to thank veterans for their service to our country. We are the beneficiaries, are we not, of their faithful service, of their many, many missions accomplished. Mission accomplished. Today's text is the mission accomplished moment in the book of Ruth. Or more appropriately, it is the redemption 
accomplished moment in the book of Ruth. And in our time together this morning, I want to point out three things about this redemption accomplished. First of all, we'll see that it is a public redemption. Second, we'll see that it's a legal redemption. And thirdly, we'll see that it is a blessed redemption. In verse 1, we see Boaz go up to the city gate and sit down there. The city gate was the most public place in the ancient world. People would come and go through the gate for commerce, to buy and sell things in the markets. Uh, people would come and go through the city gate for relational purposes, to meet up with a friend or a family member for a meal or a special event. People would come and go through the city gate to get the news, to get the latest information about the goings-on in the region or in the nation. If you wanted to know what was going on in the ancient world, you didn't go to Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. You didn't pick your favorite cable news channel of choice. You went to the city gate. And there sat Boaz, waiting for this nearer redeemer we learned about in chapter 3. Waiting in a very public place to have a very public conversation. Now, presumably, Boaz could have gone directly to the home of the nearer redeemer. He was a family member, a relative of sorts. But he didn't go to that nearer redeemer's home. He went to the city gate. Why? Because he wanted the redemption proceedings to be abundantly clear to the people, to the general public. He wanted to make sure there'd be no gossip or speculation. And sure enough, in walks the nearer redeemer. The nearer redeemer came by and Boaz invited him to have a seat along with ten elders from the community and Boaz himself. And in this public space, there'd be no disputing about what was about to take place. There'd be no back alley deals, no shady arrangements, just a perfectly honest conversation for everyone to hear, for everyone to see. And in this public space, in verse 3, Boaz informs the nearer redeemer of the opportunity and responsibility of redemption that is before him. He says in verse 3, Naomi is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. The land's for sale, buy it. Now, this sounds a bit confusing, doesn't it? I mean, why is Naomi, the widow, selling her land? And who knew she had land in the first place? We've been saying how impoverished she was. If she did have land, wouldn't she want to hang on to that asset? Well, we can't be exactly certain of every detail of Naomi's real estate holdings. We just can't know all of the details. But it seems reasonable that her husband Elimelech may have mortgaged their property before they went to sojourn in Moab ten years ago. That that mortgage would have provided them money to keep food on the table in a time of famine. And that mortgage would also have given them the financial means to move to a distant land and carry out their life there. But upon return, Naomi is now ready to sell her remaining equity, you might say, to a redeemer. That is, a redeemer who is a close relative. Someone who has the means to purchase the land outright. 
to keep the property in the family, that is, in the family of Elimelech. Because if a redeemer doesn't buy the land outright, at Naomi's death, everything that Elimelech and Malon and Kilion had once owned would be lost. The family legacy and the inheritance would be over because in the ancient world, land and inheritance passed to male relatives, not females. And remember, all that Naomi has remaining is her daughter-in-law, Ruth. Now, at first, this property redemption sounds like a great investment opportunity for the nearer redeemer. I mean, without hesitation, in front of the ten elders, and Boaz, and the whole town who's watching in this public space, he boldly says, I'll redeem it! I mean, you have to wonder if he was already speculating about the increased value of his portfolio. Maybe he's already thinking, am I going to plant barley or wheat next year? What great yields I'm going to have. Or maybe the fact of this new property coming into his holdings would then give him far more to pass along to his own children for their inheritance one day. You can just hear him say, like, tell me where to sign. Let's make this deal and make it fast. But then Boaz goes on to explain that along with the opportunity and the responsibility to redeem the land came the responsibility to marry Ruth, the Moabite widow of Malon. And in so doing, by marrying Ruth, he would bear children with Ruth and perpetuate the legacy, the family name of Elimelech and Malon. You see, the Redeemer must be willing and ready to completely redeem Naomi and Ruth from their vulnerable condition. Uh, this was not merely a real estate deal. And when the nearer Redeemer hears of this detail, the deal is immediately off. He said plainly in public, I cannot redeem it for myself. And he walked away from the redemption. He gave his right of redemption to Boaz in this public place, the city gate. And there at the city gate, Boaz enacted a legal redemption. You see, the city gate wasn't just a public space, just a gathering space to hear gossip and to conduct commerce and to, to visit with friends. No, the city gate was actually the courtroom in the ancient world. It's where the elders of the city oversaw official legal proceedings. And we can see the legality of this redemption in both actions and words in this episode. Did you notice that the, the redemption was legally ratified with an action, a, a sign, in verse 7? Verse 7 tells us the way to confirm a transaction in those days was that one would take off his sandal and hand it to the other person. And we, we see the still unnamed, near a redeemer, passed off his rights of redemption to, Mo, to Boaz by handing him his sandal. Now, that sounds really strange to us, doesn't it? Handing someone a sandal. But if you've ever had the privilege to uh, buy a piece of property or own a home, this sounds a lot easier than signing a stack of mortgage papers to me. Initial here, sign there, do this, read and accept the terms and conditions of this deal that you know you've never read. This sounds just a little easier. It's like a good old-fashioned gentleman's handshake, but in the ancient world, this made the transaction legal. According to law, it was a legally binding act. He, the near redeemer, had the first right of refusal. He refused 
to redeem Naomi and Ruth. And he passed this right to redeem to Boaz. And Boaz accepts the sandal and the opportunity to redeem Naomi and Ruth. And he makes this transaction legal by his words. Did you listen to the words of Boaz in verse 9? You are witnesses, he says. You are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belong to Elimelech and all that belong to Kilion and to Malon. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. The name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. You are witnesses. That's legal language. It's the language of a covenant. A covenant is where promises are made in the presence of witnesses. Like a wedding ceremony, right? Think about a wedding ceremony. It's witnesses that make a wedding ceremony legal. It's actually true even in the contemporary world. Dearly beloved people gather around a couple to hear a man and a woman make vows before God and before one another to remain faithful for all the days of their life. Do not separate until death do them part. And then a marriage license. It requires that two witnesses, one for the bride, one for the groom, sign in addition to the officiant, stating the, the legality of this marriage. It's no fraud, it's legal. And I want you to see that here, at the city gate of Bethlehem, we have a wedding ceremony. It doesn't look like a wedding ceremony. It might not be filled with all sorts of flowers and a white dress and all of the accoutrements of a beautiful day, but it's a beautiful wedding ceremony. It's a wedding ceremony and a real estate deal all in one. And I want you to see that it might not look like a wedding ceremony, but what we see here is a beautiful ceremony to verify that Naomi and Ruth have been legally redeemed out of their abject poverty, out of their bitter grief by Boaz. Boaz, this man of worthy character, this man of steadfast love, this man of exceeding generosity, a man whose promises can be trusted. That's what's happening here at the city gate in this legal redemption. And while there's no record of a reception with dinner and dancing, while there's no record of a housewarming party for the newlyweds here in chapter 4, there are wonderful prayers of blessing. Prayers for a blessed redemption. Listen to the people and the elders in verse 11. May the Lord make this woman, talking about Ruth, may the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. The people there on that special day are praying for the Lord's blessing on Boaz and Ruth. And they're praying specifically for the blessing of children, right? They first pray that Ruth would be like Rachel and Leah. You remember, Rachel and Leah were the wives of Jacob, later named Israel, right? And Rachel and Leah bore to Jacob 12 sons, 
Twelve sons who would one day be the heads of the twelve tribes of the people of Israel. So in praying that Ruth would be like Rachel and Leah, they're praying not only the blessing of children in the household of Boaz and Ruth, but that there would be blessing to the entire nation of Israel through Boaz and Ruth. They're praying for a national blessing on the people of God. And they pray also that their house might be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. Now that's a very interesting prayer of blessing. Because you might remember that Tamar was the daughter-in-law of Judah. In other words, Perez was the child of an incestuous relationship between Tamar, who dressed up like a prostitute, and Judah, who committed an unlawful act with his disguised daughter-in-law. But that act brought Perez into the world. Why would you pray with this blemish in mind? Well, perhaps it's because the life of Perez and the life of the tribe of Judah is just another sign of God's redeeming work. That God can and that God does bring blessing even out of our most heinous acts. After all, Perez carried on the name and the line of the tribe of Judah. Without Perez, there would be no Boaz, who was of the tribe of Judah. You see, this blessing, this prayer, is a reminder that God brings blessing out of sin. God brings blessing out of sorrow. He redeems bitter situations, and he makes them that's what God is doing here in the book of Ruth. Redemption accomplished. I hope that you have appreciated and enjoyed the true story of Naomi and Ruth and Boaz. I hope that you see this public and legal and blessed redemption before us on the pages of Scripture. But what I want to remind you about again is that there is a greater redemption accomplished. And I'm talking about the redemption of sinners by Jesus, the ultimate Redeemer. Galatians 3.13 says this. Listen. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. You see, our redemption in Christ is public and legal and blessed as well. Our redemption by Jesus was a public redemption. He hung on a tree that is a cross at the Mount of Calvary, outside the city gates of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. His trial, his crucifixion, it was all held in public for all the world to see. No honest historian disputes the crucifixion of Jesus of Nazareth. It was a public redemption. Our redemption by Jesus was also a legal redemption. He came legally to redeem us from the curse of the law, which was death. You see, the price of our redemption came in the form of the punishment of Jesus. That punishment that we deserved, he willingly took on the cross of Calvary. And let's remember that the punishment was not merely 
physical pain and gruesome suffering, though it was. The punishment was enduring the curse, the judgment of God himself. Cursed is the one who is hung on the tree. Jesus experienced spiritual death and the wrath of his holy and eternal Father on the Mount of Calvary. He paid the price of redemption with his own blood. As we heard last week at the close of my sermon from Ephesians 1-7, in Jesus we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. What can wash away my sin? Nothing. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's a legal redemption. And let us never forget that our redemption by Jesus is a blessed redemption. In the verses preceding Ephesians 1-7, which I just read, we hear these words in Ephesians 1, starting in verse 3. Just listen, and listen for the word blessed. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless for him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Church, do you know that God has blessed us in the beloved? That God has blessed us in Jesus, his beloved son? And that by faith in Jesus, we are blessed to be adopted into God's family. That we were once enslaved to sin and blinded by Satan, the God of this age. But God sent his son to redeem us, to buy us back into the family, to give us hope now and forevermore. <clears throat> Friends, may we never, never, never forget that our redemption was accomplished by Jesus, not by us. May we remember that there is no place for penance or purgatory in the Christian life because Jesus has paid it all. May we remember that there's no need for meritorious works or representing the sacrifice of Jesus in some sort of ritualistic act. No. Jesus already paid the redemption price in full. Jesus paid it all. It's all grace. And so as his completely redeemed people, may we live now and forevermore to give him the praise that he and only he deserves. Amen? Let's pray. Lord God, Thank you for being a God who redeems completely. Thank you for being a God who rescues his people out of poverty. Not just physical poverty, but the poverty of sin. Thank you, Lord God, for redeeming us by the precious blood of your Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. May we always revel in glory in that redemption accomplished. And may we, by the power of your Spirit, give you the praise that you deserve for the redemption that you've accomplished in our lives. We pray these things in Christ's name.